In this episode, the second episode of our series of uh, biographical videos of F.W. de Klerk, we will be visiting F.W. de Klerk's university days, his, uh, his days, uh, his years as a young lawyer, uh, his establishment of his own law firm in Vereniging, and the dawn of his political career. F.W., you, you went to Potchefstroom University in 1954. What was it like? What was Potchefstroom University like in 1954? Very different from what it is now. Potchefstroom was still a small university. It had about 1,500 students. So we knew everybody. And part of the initiation uh, practices they followed was aimed at getting everybody to know each other. It was intimate. Classes were relatively small, especially in the law faculty. In my LLB years, after I completed my BA, we were a class of 12 or 13 or 14 of us, which led to the opportunity to discuss with lecturers and professors rather than just to sit and make notes. It was a wonderful time from an academic point of view in my life and a wonderful time from a student life point of view. I loved university. I loved the freedom which it gave me. I loved Potchefstroom. I was very proud to be a student there. And I excelled even my highest expectations uh, in my student life. I think back with happy memories. And this is where you first developed a love for law. Uh, who were your law professors and, and what, what were the, the core uh, lessons that you emerged with? from your law studies? Well, let me first say, from, from the time I was little, I said I want to become a lawyer. But I said I want to become a lawyer to promote the truth, not a lawyer to, be, to promote <laughs> lies. So I never doubted that I wanted to study law. Uh, and therefore, I entered the course, a combined BA LLB, which stretches over five years for the two degrees. Uh, I had wonderful professors, also some bad ones, but wonderful professors, the most prominent of whom was Professor L.J. Duplessy, who was an extremely intelligent man, uh, one of the greatest intellects of our time, compared in intellect with Hendrik Verwurt and with Jan Hofmeier and people like that. And he taught us juridical philosophy. And this distinguished Potchefstroom University from other universities. We focused at Potchefstroom with its Christian higher education background on defining the principle which is important rather than just what court has decided what about this set of comparable facts. So I was taught at Potchefstroom by my professors not to get bogged down in detail, how to distinguish between detail and principle. And whenever faced with a problem on behalf of a client, to first ask what legal principle applies to this set of facts, and only thereafter go and look for confirmation in decided cases and the like. So Potsdam University had a great influence on me towards my whole approach towards the law, but also towards life. And throughout my life, I tried to ask what principle is applicable in this particular situation before getting bogged down in detail. Potchefstroom was known as a, a very conservative university and, and other students used to laugh at Potchefstroom because they said you weren't allowed to dance and uh, you weren't allowed to do a, a whole lot of things that were done at other universities. Is, is that true? It's true that dancing was <laughs> prohibited. Yes. Uh, but I didn't let that deter me. 
I, I danced at high school. So I lo never, never lost the touch. And during the holidays, I danced happily, happily, happily. Uh, but yes, in that sense, Potts was very conservative. But Potts was, politically speaking, more liberal than other universities. We had these professors, and this was carried on long after I left, when my brother was a professor there. We had these professors who questioned the ethical basis of many apartheid laws, who stood for reform. And in that sense, Potts University was a leading voice in the reform movement within the National Party. And you were elected to the Student Representative Council. Uh, what was student politics like? I enjoyed it tremendously. I remember meetings which lasted throughout the night uh, on a crisis issue, which really wasn't a crisis issue, but we only broke up at six in the morning. I was on the Students' Representative Council. Uh, I was vice chairman later on. But my first year, I started out as almost the leader of the opposition within the council. I didn't like the uh, autocratic style of the then chairman. And I fought him tooth and nail. And that led to the length of many, many meetings. I enjoyed uh, the cut and thrust of student politics very much. I was also uh, the chairman of the ASB, the Afrikaner Studentenbond, the African Afrikaans Student Association, uh, which was spread out over all Afrikaans universities. And I served on its executive committee. And we did interesting things. We invited Latuli to come and speak at Potts of Strom University. The university authorities wouldn't allow it. And I had to find a venue outside the university, but we went ahead with the meeting, and he spoke to us. He was a soft-spoken, dignified man. But what he said, we couldn't agree with at that stage. We were absolutely united behind the idea of separate development, of, of yes, full political opportunities, for blacks, but within their nationhood and within their traditional areas. So uh, we asked him many critical questions. But that was the, the, the cut and thrust of student politics, was a wonderful experience and prepared me for what later followed in my life. And you graduated from Potschefstrom uh, cum laude with an LLB, and it wasn't long before you were married. Yes, I, I met my first wife uh, when she came. She did her first year at university at Pretoria. But because she had to go to classes in the evening, she switched to Potts. And uh, it was sort of love at first sight. I had a girlfriend and that broke up. She had a boyfriend and that broke up. And uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend very soon after her arrival. She was a brilliant student. She was awarded the student as the top lady student at university in her last year. She made me study harder because I couldn't allow my girlfriend to do better at, in the academic side than me. So that's where the cum laude came from. In my first three years, I was quite laissez-faire and and, and I, w I wasn't very active. I spent much more time on student life than on studies. But in my final two years, having met her, having become close to her, she was a motivator to help me to study hard. So you were married in 1959? We were married in 1959. And uh, uh, we... I did my articles first in Klerksdorp, near Potschefstroom, and then went to a firm in Pretoria called McRobert de Villiers and Hitchie, where I completed my articles, stayed on as a professional assistant, and after one year of that, together with another friend of mine, bought a small 
rundown legal firm in the town of Verenigen. So you moved to Verenigen uh, and you set up home as a young married couple there. And what was Verenigen like? What was it like to be a, a young lawyer in Verenigen in the, in the early 60s? Well, Verenigen specifically at that stage was in a crisis because I went there just after the Sharpeville incident. And uh, the whole country's attention was focused on Verenigen because Sharpeville was one of the black uh, townships serving Verenigen and its factories, etc., etc. So there was a despondency when I arrived there. But it changed over the years. It was wonderful to build up a legal firm. Uh, two of us, both 25, 26 years old, started then to build up this law, small law firm which we bought. And later on, it became the biggest non-city law firm in South Africa of towns outside the big metropolitan areas. Uh, and uh, it was a lesson in life to be an attorney. When I was young, I always said I wanted to enter politics. My father said to me, politics is not a job, it's a calling. You made your choice to study law. First go and make a success of a legal career and only then enter politics so that you will be independent, so that you will never have to fill in a form and say, what's your occupation? I'm a politician. You must fill in, I'm a lawyer. It was the best advice I ever got. And how did you like, how did you enjoy uh, work as an attorney? I enjoyed very much. Uh, I uh, wasn't much of a court attorney in the sense we had a division of work between me and my partner. I ended up become a, a, becoming a specialist on estates, a specialist on business law. I represented some of big companies which were our clients and, and specialized also in labor law. And in the meantime, you were continuing your career as a, as a worker in the National Party structures. Yes, I was a member of the National Party. I was very soon elected to be chairman of the National Party committee for the town of Verenigen, for the constituency of Verenigen. And I led the party on a local level. Of course, we had a, a member of parliament who represented us. And I led the party for many, many years before I became the Member of Parliament for Verenigung myself. And these were tumultuous years also for South Africa. I think it was the 3rd of February 1960 that Harold Macmillan made his, his famous Winds of Change speech in the South African Parliament. A, a month later, uh, there was Sharpeville to which you referred. The same year, the ANC launched its uh, armed struggle what was your reaction to these developments? Well, I was deeply interested. I followed everything. I was, of course, focused on building my legal career, etc. But as the amateur politician, I was deeply interested, deeply concerned, deeply concerned about Sharpeville. Understanding what Harold Macmillan was saying, realizing that the future held many challenges, participating in debates within the National Party about reform. The reforms were mediocre in looking back now. But at that stage, some of the steps which were taken were important. Some of the steps which were taken under Verwoerd was far-reaching. It wasn't the original policy of apartheid that the so-called black homelands could become fully independent. Verwoerd changed that. And so we felt 
more justified in supporting separate development because there was a just outcome which we could foresee also for black South Africans. Of course, with hindsight, we realize, I realize, everybody realized today how impracticable it was. But at university, there was also the report of the Tomlinson Commission, which was more than a 3,000 page report, which said how could the homelands, the black homelands, be developed economically. And we were, I was personally, and many of my fellow nationalists, deeply disappointed, and I was still at university, when Vervoort rejected that because he said white capital shouldn't be allowed into the black homelands. And if the Tomlinson report was implemented effectively, South Africa might have looked different today. So yes, it was turmoil, it was time for deep, deep debate, but it never ended there. It carried on straight through until 1994. Yes, and then you also had the chance of meeting Hendrik Vervoort and expressing some of your concerns to him, didn't you, as a young, as a young uh, member of the National Party? Yes, I met him quite a few times because he was friends with my parents. But he came, he had a little hideout, small holding on the Waal River near Verenigung. And the Verenigung National Party decided, because he was Prime Minister, we had to welcome him to our area. So we took him a fridge as a present to welcome him. I was chairman of the National Party Divisional Council in Vienna. I led the delegation and we were sitting outside uh, his little home there and had time to talk. And I had attacked him, of course, in, in a very respectful way on his policy regarding brown South Africans. I said, I can see the ethical basis for the black nations because they had a history of governing themselves. But the brown South Africans never governed themselves. They were always part of the same broader community as white South Africans. And it was not justifiable to keep them out of the political mainstream and somehow or another, fresh thinking was necessary about it. And I remember him replying, he agrees with me. But if we move too fast with the brown South Africans giving them full political rights, then the same would apply to black South Africans. And therefore, we must be patient a bit, but the time will come when brown South Africans would get full political rights. And what was your impression of him as a man? He was very clever. I didn't like him very much. He was a bit too dictatorial. Later on, I served in the cabinet of another dictatorial leader of the National Party, Mr. P. W. Buta. From school time onwards, I didn't like people being dictatorial. I rebelled against it. And in that sense, also from what my father sometimes told us, what went on in cabinet and so on, I didn't like Dr. Farouk. I admired his intellect. And at that stage, except for the brown people, I supported his racial policies. And yet uh, his racial policies made provision for, for black self-determination in only 13.7% of the country in, in all sorts of little bits and pieces of homelands. Did you accept that? No, I was highly critical of that. It was also an aspect of the Tomlinson report, which he didn't implement and accept fully. There was a movement towards buying up some white farms, adding it on to the traditional homelands, uh, and rationalizing to some extent the borders. But the attempts fell far short of what should have been done to make it really just and equitable. And from a young age in, in politics, later on as a junior member of parliament, I was highly critical of the lack of action 
on consolidating the homelands into acceptable countries with borders which could become really independent. And all of the time, all of this time, you were still building up your law firm in Vereniging, but you were also, I think, getting a little restless because in 1972, your old university, Potsdam, came back and invited you to become professor of administrative law at Potsdam, and you found this very, very tempting. I didn't only find it tempting, I actually accepted it. I was getting restless and I thought, well, let me go and become a professor and see what happens. Maybe I build a career there, maybe I become vice chancellor of the university one day, or maybe I enter politics at a later stage in my life. I was then 36 years old. And then simultaneously, I already bought a house in Potsdam. Simultaneously with that, Suddenly, our MP was appointed ambassador to Italy and my National Party committee members came to me and said, you can't leave us now, we want you as our MP. So I had to take a decision. And I went to the then vice chancellor of the university and said, he was related to me, he was married to a declare, and said, what must I do? And he said, we're okay at Potsdam, without you we can always find somebody. But politics needs somebody like you. My advice is enter politics. He freed me of my obligation to the university. I decided to take the political route. I never looked back and I think it was the right choice for me. And you stood as the National Party candidate in a by-election in Vereniging in 1972 in 1972 in october that was your first electoral struggle what was what was it like it was quite a struggle we 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 fought hardest against the uh the breakaway wing of the former national party the old national party uh the ha and peer they called themselves under a certain man called jaap Mare. And it was a dirty election. But I enjoyed the cut and thrust of it. And I was elected with a reduced majority, but I was elected. This was a big change for your family. I believe you had bought yourself a beautiful home on the banks of the Vaal River. And now you had to give all of this up. You had to give up your successful law career, pack up, pack up the house and go to Cape Town and live in much diminished accommodation. <laughs> Absolutely, it was. It, it, I asked great sacrifices of my family. And financially, it was a great setback for me. But I did it because I believed I had a calling. Next uh, episode, we will be looking at F.W. de Klerk's career as a young member of parliament, as a backbencher and then as a junior cabinet minister.